Flat Earthers love to say we see too far. They zoom in on a blurry horizon with a telephoto lens, sight some distant object, and then say this falsifies the R value. By R value, they mean the radius of the globe, 3,959 miles or 6,371 kilometers. What's their logic to say it's falsified? Well, they plug the measurements of their observation into some clumsy math like 8 inches per mile squared or some online calculator, which spits out the feet of curvature at the given distance, which flat earthers then say is missing. Sometimes we're very lucky and they not only give accurate measurements, but also account for things like observer height. Of course, most of the time, the horizontal distance they get from Google Maps or some other normal globe source, which they don't realize means it uses the globe-exclusive Haversine formula derived from spherical trigonometry. But let's set that aside for now. One thing they pretty much never account for is atmospheric refraction. In fact, if you bring this up, they usually tantrum and call it a globe rescuing device, even though they use refraction as a flat earth rescuing device all the time. So is it a globe rescuing device? I think we can all agree that a rescuing device is defined by three main traits. Number one, it's speculation. That is, it has no positive evidence pulling you toward it, only negative evidence chasing you toward it away from some more obvious conclusion. Number two, it contradicts other claims or conclusions that you've made elsewhere on other topics. And number three, it's often scientifically or mathematically incoherent all by itself. It's just broken and doesn't even work. Call and get a refund. Now, refraction is real, as even flat earthers admit. And not just through glass or water. Like, literally, all you have to do is look at heat waves over an open flame. Clearly, light can bend if it travels through changing conditions of air. In fact, it turns out, scientists for the last five centuries did not spend all their time twiddling their thumbs, and we've got a pretty exact understanding of this. Flat Earthers even accept and try to cherry-pick this work, like Snell's Law. And if they know anything about it, they admit there's a pressure gradient in the atmosphere. Just read a barometer at sea level, then climb a mountain and read it again, and the pressure will be much lower. So far, so good. The problem is, the ingredients I just laid out already have inevitable consequences according to logic and math. Flat earthers agree with the ingredients, but they cannot follow the logic to see the consequences. They just fall off the wagon. They don't understand. It's fine to not understand something, but to claim that you do understand so that you can mock and deny it, well, that's something else. So let's walk through it. Light bends when it meets a change in medium, and that change has two important properties. How much does it change? And what is the direction of change versus the direction of the light ray? With those two pieces of information, you can use Snell's law to figure out exactly how the light will bend every single time. In rough terms, the light bends toward the denser medium. So if it's water and air, it bends toward the water. Same with glass and air, it bends toward the glass. Or if it's air versus air, it bends toward the denser air. But the direction of change matters too. And that's why when we make a lens, we can precisely control the way the light bends through it just by shaping the surface angle. So in the atmosphere, where is the denser air? At sea level. And what's the direction of change? Up and down. So if we want to compare the atmosphere to a lens, we have to imagine the entire atmosphere as one single giant lens where the surface angle is pretty much always facing upward and we are inside the glass of that lens. This already completely invalidates the way that flat earthers try to use it as a rescuing device. Their tricks and illusions require magnifying images in the horizontal direction, which requires a lens whose surface faces sideways, not upward. But it's much worse than that. A magnifying lens has an axis, and you can't fit multiple magnifying axes side by side with no visible boundary. So their trick could only work facing one direction at a time, for one observer at a time, and has also magically never been seen from any other angle by anyone, especially the angle that, uh, given the extreme magnification they claim, would result in people literally burning to death from magnified sunlight. Yeah, did I mention that rescuing devices were broken and incoherent? This one's a dazzling case study. Okay, back to real science. If the lens of the atmosphere is one giant one facing straight upward, how does the light bend? Remember that I said it bends toward the denser medium. 
In this case, that means toward the ground, which means around the curve of the Earth. Already we see what a horrendous wrench in the works this is for someone staring through a P-1000 hoping to falsify the R value. And this is not a post hoc speculation. This is the inevitable consequence of the observed physical laws and conditions that we have always known and that flat earthers already accept. If it seems unexpected, that is not the fault of the science. It's the fault of the student. Okay, but how far does this carry? Some flat earthers demand to know what is the upper limit for how far refraction can bend around the Earth so they can dig around for a longer observation that's impossible on a globe. Because they've already made up their minds not only that such a hard limit should rightfully exist, but also that it's been beaten. They don't like the real answers to either of those questions. No, such a hard limit does not exist. And no, observational data on this does not exceed globe expectations. Why isn't there a hard limit? Because the atmosphere is turbulent. Optics through a turbulent medium produce stochastic results. Just like the weather can be hard to predict, so is the farthest you can see on a globe. Just like you can have fluke weather, you can have fluke long-range sightings. Does that mean globers just don't have any rules? No! A hard numeric limit is not the only way to have rational scientific expectations about the physical world. The concept that flat earthers are missing here is called non-uniform probability. It's not like rolling a die, where each of the six sides has equal probability. It's much more like an inverse relation, where the longer the distance, the lower the probability. As you increase your distance past the geometric globe horizon, seeing that far in practice keeps getting less and less and less likely, but never becomes 100% categorically impossible. That's just not how it works. Again, if this seems convenient for the globe, that's a sign of ignorance in flat earthers. They're the ones who chose this method for disproving the globe. No real scientist has ever suggested it for measuring the Earth, and no flat earther has ever consulted them on what a good method would be. It's just bad science because it doesn't prove anything. It's like this. If you want to see outside, do you pick the large, clear window or the small, dirty one? Flat earthers love the dirty one because they don't believe the Earth is flat. They want it to be flat, so the only methods good enough for them are the ones they can easily abuse. So what data do they have? I was impressed when I saw this. They used MediaWiki software and compiled a table. It's like, wow, it's so cute. They tried, they imitated normal academic sources. And now, of course, it's still a complete mess. The logic behind what columns to include or not include is naive and somewhat nonsensical. Some of it's non-numeric. It conflates multiple similar methods and purported anomalies. And even within the data presented, there's a high volume of errors, sometimes very severe. So I have very low confidence in the accuracy of the starting measurements in the left-hand columns. But since I can't easily check that part of the data, let's just be generous and assume it's all 100% true. Then let's use it to correct the errors on the right and put it all on a scatter plot. To do this, I wrote a few scripts to extract and process the data. My code is all on GitHub if you want to see it. Link in the YouTube video description. And I used Google Sheets to create the plot, which is right here. Notice that I did not use linear units for the anomaly. Online curve calculators give you feet just to be layman friendly, but light doesn't really care about distance, only angle, because a change of one degree near your eye over a distance of just two miles will compound into hundreds of feet. So to help you visualize what size anomaly we're talking about, almost all of these are smaller than a US dime held at arm's length. And that's if your arm is pretty long. And yes, the moon is even smaller than that. It's way smaller in the sky than most people realize. And no, a supermoon is not significantly larger. What this means is that when the flat earther or whoever took each of these observations of so-called missing curvature, right then and there, if they had taken a US dime out and held it at arm's length, the width of the dime in their eye would have been larger than the missing curvature. Yeah, that's what flat earthers have been whining about this whole time. That's their data that falsifies the R value, their justification for saying Earth measures flat. Hmm, I wonder if atmospheric lensing can explain that size of anomaly. 
Now we've discussed the concepts to answer that question, but I admit the details are extremely complicated and hard to compute. So guess what? I wrote a simulation, which is also on GitHub, link in the YouTube video description. I built this simulation using all completely normal science that it's taught in high school. You're looking at a vertical cross section that's 900 kilometers wide and 35 kilometers tall, which spans an arc of about eight degrees along the surface of the globe. This is really difficult to see on a computer screen, so why don't we just squash it to a quarter of its width? I modeled the atmospheric density gradient as accurately as possible. Then I put an observer on the left and traced a ray horizontally from their eye. Of course, horizontal at their location on the globe, which is tilted on the screen because it's not in the middle. I put a straight line in red for reference, while the white line undergoes continuous refraction as it travels through the changing atmosphere. Here is the exact source code for that refraction. Yes, that's basically straight from Wikipedia. That's not a joke or a trick. And look what happens. With a standard gradient and no turbulence, my simulation already deflects it from the geometric horizon by about one degree. That's not perfectly accurate to standard conditions on Earth, but the reason why helps to illustrate my point. The amount of refraction is extremely sensitive to small changes in the air. Even this result is enough to explain a huge number of flat Earth data points. But the atmosphere is not static. To be more fair, we need to add some random turbulence. There's a strong selection bias in the flat Earth data. Obviously, they're not going to publish and share all the times that we don't see too far. So to imitate this, I very slightly nudged the randomness of the turbulence. And here it is. If we compare it to their data, Oh, <laughs> that covers almost all of their examples. There's one notable exception in my data set, this outlier way up here. To explain this, let's talk about temperature inversions. Others like Michael Toon and Danny Faulkner have provided info on this in more depth, but the gist is warmer, less dense air sitting above cooler, denser air, which happens on clear sunny days over bodies of water. And it happens all the time. This is not even abnormal at all. So how does it affect refraction? Well, to understand that, we need to understand how a temperature inversion affects the density gradient compared to the standard conditions that we were just simulating. If we look up ideal gas law on Wikipedia, we find this, which is useful when you have a fixed mass of gas, like in a balloon or a piston chamber where N is constant and V might be variable. But it's not so useful for analyzing open portions of the Earth's atmosphere. This expectation of a container sends flat earthers into an absolute meltdown. To make the analysis, we have to use the molar form of the gas law, solved for density, where m is the air's molar mass. What happened to v? With the introduction of molar mass, we unlocked total mass as a variable, which then got combined with volume and became density. Anyway, we can now treat m over r as a constant, which leaves a fairly simple three-way correlation between density, pressure, and temperature. But the weird thing is, under standard atmospheric conditions, all three of these variables decrease with altitude. How? Because the numerator, pressure, falls off much faster than the denominator, temperature, which causes the quotient, density, to fall too. And notice what a temperature inversion does to this situation. If the numerator already decreases quickly with altitude, but now the denominator starts actually increasing, then the quotient is going to drop off very, very fast. None of the gradients invert except temperature, and the density gradient becomes extreme. So let's model a more extreme gradient in my simulation. Oh boy, look at that. It almost hugs the ground for hundreds of miles. And by the way, if the gradient shifts in just the right way to create a superior mirage with internal reflection, it doesn't even have to be that steep overall. The light will get trapped and actually hug the ground. The things I'm choosing in this simulation are very slight variations of density that have a huge impact on how far you can see. The point is to show what a messy labyrinth it becomes of science saying it depends, it depends, it depends all on the turbulent dynamics of the weather. Is the density gradient steep or gentle? Is the steep part high or low? Does it continue far or get mellow nearby? Etc. Etc. Etc any atmospheric conditions that you can imagine 
can produce a new blue dot on this chart somewhere, but with likelihood inversely proportional to its deviation from this line. Even this 850 kilometer outlier is trivial to explain. Do we expect to see that kind of anomaly every single day? No, but flat earthers have a lot fewer of those. All we have to do is look at the shape of this data. When globe expectations are properly understood, we can see that observations absolutely do not exceed them, not even by a little bit, and not even when collected for the sole hostile purpose of disproving the globe. It's actually pathetic. There's a couple last things worth mentioning. First is Gene Techman on TikTok. He loves to bring up radar and radio transmissions, but appears not to understand a few things. Number one, when literature on radar uses the term line of sight, this does not mean that it's exempt from Snell's law or atmospheric refraction. This term is actually used to distinguish from over the horizon radar. That's right, the rest of the world does not feel the need to vigilantly clarify lest you flat earthers misunderstand something. You are not that important to them. Number two, over the horizon radar is a thing. And there's two main types, sky wave in high frequency, this bounces waves off the ionosphere, and ground wave in very low frequency. This uses signals at such enormously long wavelength that it can actually diffract around the Earth's curve. Yes, diffraction is a thing. Number three, Many of the examples that Gene Techman cites of long-range communication indeed use over-the-horizon propagation, which is by definition not line of sight. This includes the historical communication mentioned in this plaque that he once randomly sent me a photo of. Before he was banned? Huh. Well, hardly surprising, since so many flat earthers love bullying and simping for the mustache man. Anyway, I looked up this Marconi transmission, and yes, it was over-the-horizon radio, using ground waves. Number four, most recently he's latched onto microwave because he cherry-picked this Wikipedia article saying that microwave is limited to 30 to 40 miles, apparently missing the key phrase on the surface of the earth, which excludes his primary example that used highly specialized equipment at an altitude of 13,000 feet. Also, I see no citation in the article, which means that Wikipedia editors could potentially challenge and remove that number as unverified research. See a pattern? Poor research, even worse comprehension, a tendency toward misinformation and cherry picking. It's a plague, and it completely defines the flat Earth side. However, last thing to note, and I am actually shocked that I'm about to say this, but on this specific topic, the dumbest thing by far that I have ever heard a flat earther say came from none other than Austin Witsit, the flat Earth priest of Brainiacs. Of course, it's a silhouette refraction affects light, not the absence of light. Do you agree, though, that refraction is the bending of light, which means that a silhouette can't be refracted because it is the absence of light? What? Can a silhouette be refracted? You're, if you're seeing something, there's light traveling to your eyes. So sure, but, so but the, mountains, be there. the mountains should be below the curve of the Earth. Right. But we're seeing the silhouette once it gets backlit, which means you need a line of sight to the physical object blocking the light. I don't know, man. You're, yeah. So we you're, you're the doing, oh, I see. I saw a thing. Therefore, everything we know about physics and science in general is wrong. It's just not going to fly. He was wide open and Professor Dave let him off so easy. Yes, a silhouette is the absence of light in the same sense that a pothole is the absence of road saying that a silhouette can't be refracted because it's not light is like saying that a pothole can't be shaken by an earthquake because it's not asphalt. You seen one of these? I could not believe my ears when I heard Austin say that. And of course, all the lesser flurf trolls are repeating it too. They claim refraction, but shadows don't refract, so thanks for It no. does refract. Do, do shadows refract? Yes, they do. Now, that would be the refraction of light, bud. It hands down takes the dumb award on we see too far arguments. Absolutely majestic. So no, we do not see too far. The moral of this story is pretty basic. Just learn science before you deny it. Thank you so much for watching. See you around.